get to have a habit. It's a ritual. And, 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 and let's face it, the habit isn't necessarily a bad thing. Habit can be a good thing. Uh, but, but like a lot of things, we can kind of take for granted um, what we're doing, what it means. And so even as we give these gifts, we pause and reflect and, and see that we are giving from an attitude of gratitude, that we are giving out of appreciation for what God has done for us, that we're not merely paying bills, though, let's face it, part of our finances are used to literally just pay the bills so that we can operate um, as a ministry, um, that some of the mission money that we go is used just to, to pay the bills so that um, that mission work can continue. Um, we know that in our own daily lives, there's a lot of things that we might not necessarily want to spend money on, but we know we need to. But so much more than paying the bills is this attitude of what I have belongs to God. That what I have is something that He has entrusted me with, and our giving, our dedication of our offering, is our commitment of our resources, our commitment of ourselves to His ministry, wherever that may be, and wherever it may put us. And so while we are perhaps sometimes in our minds specifically dedicating the, the check that we put in the mail this week or the, the bank draft that was done for what we dropped in the offering box near the sanctuary, we're also committing our attitudes and behaviors and actions on Thursday morning uh, when we're stuck in traffic or we're uh, picking up a coffee at Wawa that we are continuing to use who we are and what we are at every moment for the sake of the kingdom. This is our offertory prayer. Holy God, receive these gifts. Examine our hearts and see in what manner we give these things. Encourage us to be cheerful givers, excited about how what we have and who we are can be used by you to share the wonderful words of life, that we can be part of calling someone back into relationship with you or deepening that relationship. May our gifts be used, whether in our daily lives, in the life of Scotch Plains Baptist Church, or the various missions we support, may our gifts be used for your glory and your honor. These we dedicate in the name of Jesus Christ. Our brother. Amen. Our hymn this morning um, is hymn number 116. If you're using a hymnal from Scotch Plains Baptist, if you're using our worship packet, um, it's in, included in there. A um, little, little difference. Um, if you're using our hymnal, our hymnal only has verses 1, 2, and 3. Um, so if you have your hymnal with you, but you also have uh, printed the order of service, maybe not the whole packet. Uh, you'll see the order of service. I've actually written out the fourth verse uh, there. I'll type it out. Um, I shall never forget that day, blessed be the name of the Lord, when Jesus washed my sins away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I was very tempted to say, well, we'll just sing the first three verses. I mean, that's a very kind of church thing to do sometimes. Uh, when there's multiple verses, to sing verses one, two, and the last, or verse three, or such. But man, I hated to leave out that line about, I shall never forget that day when Jesus washed my sins away. So we are including it there. Um, give you a couple of formats to do that. And if you don't have a bit, uh, verse 4 to you, go ahead and re-sing verse 1. Uh, we can't hear you anyway. Uh, let's sing together. Blessed be the name.
we gather our prayers together. And perhaps we might not be physically in the same room. But let's be honest, that was true in 1987 as well. That we shared prayer requests and some were prayed for in church while some folks were in the sanctuary. But somebody in the else was back working in the nursery. And somebody else was at home waiting for the time when the uh, cassette tape, the audio cassette, would be delivered to them. And they might hear that prayer. But we are gathered in prayer when we pray in unity of spirit. And so we bring our prayer requests. And some have been sent through emails or through texts and some in phone calls and some over the kitchen table. Some have been shared here in the sanctuary this morning and some you found uh, through your social media. Uh, you found a prayer request by listening to the, the news or reading a headline. And we unite in prayer. And we continue to be united because hopefully some of these things aren't just prayed for right now when the pastor has the microphone. But that you've written them down and you get the prayer list uh, emailed to you that you continue to pass these things on and you continue to pray for these things. But for now, we pause as part of our worship, an intentional pause where we unite together in prayer for one another. Join me now for the pastor of our Holy God. Thank you for what you've done for us through Jesus Christ. Blessed is that name, and blessed are we through that name. We recognize this. We recognize who we were, and we recognize how you called us and touched us and brought you to yourself. And now we're encouraged to continue to share that name with others. Thank you for what you've done for us through Jesus Christ. Encourage us, strengthen us as you continue to equip us, call us, send us to share that name. And Father, we share other names today. We, we lift up those who are bereaved and, and those who are undergoing testing, those who are dealing with um, chronic illnesses, those who are, are working on, on their mental health, those who are... are Facing financial crisis, those uh, dealing with addiction, those celebrating milestones, uh, anniversaries and birthdays and weddings. Lord, we bring these names and then some of these faces flash by our, our mind's eyes. We pray together. We bring the things we've seen in headlines and the, the news stories that we've come. And we recognize the need for folks to know the name of Jesus. In our own families and in our communities, but around the world. And we see so much hurt and turmoil and, and anger. So much competition and bitterness. So much strife. We, to quote the Bible here, of wars and rumors of wars. Hearts break for your people. And so, Father, we we call out names. And we call out conditions. We call out challenges. We call out evil spirits. We call out the work of the devil. And we offer up the grace of Jesus. We ask that you make us instruments of your peace. That you allow us to be your hands and feet. That the gospel not be something we talk about in church, but a way in which we can live our lives. We recognize we won't always do it perfectly. And sometimes we rarely get it even close. But we thank you that you continue to equip us and encourage us and continue to send us. That you, you knew our flaws and weaknesses before you even called us. You loved us anyway. You call us to love a world that is broken and battered and bruised. And so, Father, we offer up our prayer lists. 
written down or kept in the back of our minds. We offer up those things that cause us to sigh, either with contentment or in despair. And we trust all these things to you. We bring them before you because you have proven yourself trustworthy. So in the name of our brother Jesus Christ, hear, O Lord, this, our prayer. Amen. I was in the grocery store the other day, and I'm going to be honest, that's not much of a surprise. I'm probably in the grocery store more often than a lot of you. Primarily because since my daughter works there, uh, and often I'm the one who picks her up from work, that there are things that we don't necessarily get to the weekly shopping list, but are kind of added daily. And hey, since you're going anyway, I might as well go in and grab something. So I was there the other day picking her up from work, and I happened to notice the promotional display. Well, you're supposed to notice the promotional display. And I caught what they were doing. I caught what their promotion was going to be. Um, but it struck me in a way that I'm sure they did not intend. See, it probably won't be a surprise to you unless you're watching this six months down the road. But today is a day when there is a football game on that a lot of people who never watch any football will tune in for this to watch the commercials. And will show up at a party about football where they won't pay a bit of attention to the game, but they'll enjoy the food. The grocery store knows that. Now, the corporation that owns the title to that game doesn't let folks just use that title. Uh, we do all the time. But uh, a lot of advertisements and, uh, and such have to kind of dance around it. And so, when I was at the grocery store, there were promotions for the big game. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Everybody knows what the big game is. They might not know who's playing in it. They might not know where it's being played. They might not know what time it starts, but they know what time the party begins. And so the grocery store wants you to buy all the stuff you need for the big game. Well, today's February 13th, which tomorrow is February 14th. And again, not much of a surprise there, the way numbers work. But, February 14th is also a big day for a lot of folks, particularly for folks who sell things that might help people with that big day. Of course, tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Um, my daughter, who works at the grocery store, commented on how beautiful it was and how full it was with flowers, but even she commented on how expensive the roses were. I don't know if anybody else buys grocery store flowers, but some of us do. They're still the same flowers. But they tend to be economical, except this one. And there's some other things that probably the prices have gone up for this week. And you don't normally see a whole lot of uh, teddy bears at the grocery store, but they're on display. Um, chocolates that you might not normally look at twice, you're now weighing between two different options that are both overpriced. Of course, the grocery store wants you to pay attention to Valentine's Day. I don't know if, if it, uh, I'm guessing from a marketing standpoint, they would rather that the big game and the big day were separated by a week so they could run two separate sales and maybe get a little more money out of your wallet. But the advertisement was, and this is what caught my eye, on the same banner, the big game and Valentine's. as it should be, but the way my mind was hearing that, and I'm not always cynical, I think I tend to get that way sometimes, but in my mind, my cynicism was that Valentine's Day is often, for many, just another big game. I'm going to bet that that doesn't come as a surprise to some of you. 
Others of you will be shocked to even think that. Or think, well, how cynical can he be? Valentine's Day is all about love and romance and hope and joy. Well, it's not for everybody. And for a lot of folks, it's just another game to play. I'm guessing there's a lot of manipulation that goes on around Valentine's Day. There's a lot of hype and a lot of expectation. A lot of comparison between what this couple does and what that couple does. And why didn't you and you had better? I'm betting there's a lot of folks who are on the verge of breaking up and one party who knows they're on the verge of breaking up is deciding to wait until after Valentine's Day. And there's still going to be a big production. But it's a game because ne next week there's going to be heartbreak. And I'm betting that there's some others who are going to use Valentine's Day as a game to make a move that perhaps would not be received at other times of the year because it's Valentine's Day. And so the cynical side of my mind, looking at that, read the big game and Valentine's Day and saw them as kind of the same thing. And maybe that is a bit jaded. I think it really rings true for a lot of folks. And in a lot of circumstances. I'm going to guess that some of you listening to this might be able to even now be replaying in your mind a Valentine's Day that you go back and say, man, that was just a big game. And maybe you were a willing part of it. Maybe you were the perpetrator. Or maybe, and maybe it's too harsh to use this word, maybe you were the victim. The one being played. And while that sounds terribly curmudgeonly or grumpy or glass half empty, I think it's probably reality for a lot of situations. Valentine's Day is also a time, particularly for those involved in the lives of young people where you kind of want to tamper down some expectations. You kind of want to introduce some reality in the situation. You don't want to squash young love. But you do want to make sure there's some boundaries to that young You want to talk about the facts of life. You know, and Valentine's Day is a lot of life. A lot of love, there's also a lot of heartbreak. And for those playing the game, there's perhaps some unintended consequences. And so we want to kind of spell that out. And some of you will remember that TV show. Started in the 70s, but I think of it as kind of an 80s thing. It's kind of picked up speed in the 80s, perhaps. But that showed the facts of life about a, a girl's boarding school. And you might remember the theme music to it. Um, and let's face it, there's a lot of TV theme music that gets stuck in our mind because we have watched those episodes week after week. Or maybe you watch them in reruns day after day. But the, 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 the words that stick in your mind are the words that I heard my wife singing earlier today. You take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have the facts of life. That's a pretty simple little line, isn't it? You take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have the facts of life. This idea that that song is portraying of life is made up of diverse parts. 
and probably just about anything we hit on, we can throw on a, con on a continuum from good to bad to indifferent, but where does it, where does it fit? And really, life is made up of all those things. You blend it all together. Now, it's interesting that if I, if I, if, if you're of the right demographic, if I put out there the title of the Facts of Life, and I mentioned the TV theme show, and you start to sing and you sing those words, and you know it's the theme, kind of interesting that that's not the original words. That was season two started with those words. Season one opened with there's a place you've got to go for learning. All you want to know about the facts of life, the facts of life. When books are what you're there about, and looks are what you care about, the time is right to learn the facts of life. When the world never seems to be living up to your dreams, you say, ah, wait, I recognize that. Well, they recycled that in the theme. When the world never seems to be living up to your dreams, it's time you started finding out that everything is all about the facts of life. Um, and then, <laughs> has a line, a, a verse, when the boys you used, you used to hate you date, when the boys you used to hate you date, I guess you best investigate the facts of life, you gotta get them right, the facts of life, the facts of life. And there were other verses that came. Uh, that song was, was written by Alan Thicke, uh, and again, Depends on what generation you're from. Some of you know Alan Thicke because he had a talk show, Thick of the Night. Um, some of you remember that he was uh, Dr. Seaver on Growing Pains, and, uh, another popular sitcom. Um, uh, Facts of Life was a spin-off of, of a show, Different Strokes, um, and he wrote the theme for that as well. He wrote the theme for a bunch of game shows. He wrote it, uh, and he was married to this woman, Gloria Lord. Some of you know Gloria Loring because she was a soap opera act, soap actress, um, and she had some hit songs um, and some, some big songs. She, she co-wrote wrote this with him. She later put this on an album, um, and she had different verses uh, on, on her album. Um, some of you know Alan Thicke. Uh, he passed just a couple years ago as being the father of Robin Thicke, um, who is a, a music singer, producer, uh, judge on The Masked Singer, um, and his dad wrote this song, The Facts of Life. But this whole idea of, oh, and by the way, never charted on a billboard. Didn't make it up there. Um, but a lot of folks know, uh, and a lot of folks will actually identify this as one of their favorite uh, TV theme songs. Sometimes those, those rules that your parents would just don't understand, now you look back and it makes a lot of sense and you say, they understood a lot more than I gave them credit for. And maybe those things that you thought were just the greatest step, I mean, I've seen some of your yearbook pictures. Maybe you look back and say, maybe that wasn't as good as I thought it was. The facts of life. With the big game coming up, with Valentine's coming up, which can be a big game, we need to understand facts of life, but more than that, just in how we live out our lives, we need to understand how to take the good and take the bad, and understand the facts of life. We actually see that now. now Jesus did not sing those words, but we see that when we get to the gospel story today, Luke chapter 6, beginning with verse 17. 
Now, it's, it's interesting in, in kind of setting up where this story comes from. This comes right out of um, coming down from the mountain, uh, doing some, some teaching, some gathering, some healing, identifying the 12 disciples out of the group of disciples, which were out of a group of those who were kind of listeners, uh, which were a group out of a group of those who kind of heard, so kind of narrowed down to 12 disciples that kind of been identified as such for the first time, 12 apostles. And then we get this story. He went down with them and stood on a level place. Now some of you, if you look at your Bible, it might have, right before this, might have a little, a little subtitle that says Sermon on the Plain. Because they're down on a level place. And that kind of juxtaposes it with the Sermon on the Mount. Um, there's going to be a lot of similarities, a lot of the same language, a lot of the same themes um, in the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, but they are clearly two distinct, different, separate occasions. And there are some who say, oh, well, like, that can't be because some, it's too similar, it's too close. Well, come on. Have you never told the same story twice? Have you never told it with a slightly different impact based on your audience or, or how you're sharing it? I mean, already today we talked about the fact that I don't, I don't know how to pronounce blessed, is it blessed or blessed? Uh, and I'm, I'm guessing some of the music folks might tell me it might be because oh, sometimes you need two notes or you got to get two syllables or whatever. Uh, but when we were saying blessed be the tie, if you ever look at how that's spelled, that's spelled with a T, B-L-E-S-T instead of S-S-E-D. But you've heard me say, that I hear blessed or blessed and I think God touched. And that's not the first time you've heard me say that. Just about every time we talk about miracles, you hear me say the same thing. A miracle is never a miracle for the sake of being a miracle. I say the same things. I repeat the same thing. Uh, the challenge of having been here at Scotch Springs Baptist Church for 31 years is I repeat the same anecdotes. I tell the same lame jokes. I introduce certain hymns the same way every time. So could Jesus, the master teacher, have found a theme that he likes and repeat it? To kind of share it once on a mountain and once on a plane and who knows how many other times. And maybe change it a little bit, change it up for the audience, change it up for who's there. Change it up for what an emphasis that he wants to place on it. But to take a theme, to take an outline and, and reuse it. Doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, I would be shocked if I found out that your favorite professor from college never repeated a lecture. Or that your favorite teacher from middle school didn't tell the same joke or introduce the same subject the same way year after year after year, and your siblings all know the same story because you all have the same teacher. So, Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, Two different sermons built around a similar theme, the same thing. See, so we didn't even get to verse 17 yet. A large crowd of his disciples were there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coastal region around Tyre and Siddha. And again, this is just trying to explain, it's, it's a multi-level crowd. Twelve apostles, other disciples, this other crowd, Jewish crowd from Judea and Jerusalem, Probably trying to identify a Greek or Gentile crowd from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. <clears throat> Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Verse 20, looking at his disciples. Look at his disciples. Luke here identifies that there's this crowd, different levels of commitment, levels of experience, if you will, levels of interest. Some there just to get the healing, some to get the healing and the teaching, some to get the teaching, a variety of folks there. But he looks at his disciples. As he teaches, I don't think he spends his whole time looking at just the disciples, but he makes 
eye contact with them. Now, Luke was not one of those disciples. Luke did some investigation to get his details and, and probably um, got a bunch of stuff through Peter. But I wonder how many disciples, when they told this story about the Sermon on the Plain, talked about he gathered everybody down there and he stood up and he looked at this crowd and then he looked at us. And I wonder if each of the disciples said, and he looked me in the eyes. And he began teaching. I wonder if he scanned across his disciples, made sure that all of them were paying attention because he's just about to drop on them the facts of life. He's just about to talk, tell them about the good and the bad. And he wants to make sure they hear. Look at his disciples. He said, blessed are you who are poor. Now this is a little different than how Matthew has this on the Sermon on the Mount. And some of you are trying right now, you're, you're putting that together and you're figuring out what's missing. Sermon on the Mount, blessed are you who are poor in spirit. See, Matthew kind of has a more spiritual spin on his. And I don't know that that's necessarily because Matthew was trying to spiritize it a bit more. I'm perfectly content with saying Jesus actually said it that way because he was emphasizing a spiritual thing. But now, when he's telling it here in the Sermon on the Plain, he drops that out because he's not over-spiritualizing it. He's just given the facts of life. Some of you are poor. You don't have two dimes to run rub together. Blessed are you who are poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. Man, I think that has been so misconstrued over time. That we've kind of built up this nobleness of poverty. Kind of like, you remember studying in, in, in literature? You remember studying about the, the themes of, of the noble savage? You remember that from, from high school? This idea that, you know, the, um, well, today we would refer to first peoples or native peoples, native tribes, first Americans. Back when I was in school, we would have said the Indians or the American Indians. And this idea that in Europe developed this idea of the noble savage, that they are living life so much better, they're closer to nature. Um, and those of you from the city with your industrialization, you're, you're so far removed from that nobleness. Um, and then this confusion on why is there trouble between two warring groups. Part of it comes out of the idea of the noble savage. How could, how could you battle them? And we know that probably was an exaggerated picture. And we exaggerate this picture a little bit when we talk about the nobility. We all, I don't know that anybody's ever used this language, but we express this idea of the nobility of poverty. I mean, if, all, if it fits in movie themes, if it's in TV shows, we watch about that poor person who's really living life at the best. I mean, we just came off the Christmas season and, and we throw darts at Ebenezer Scrooge in his wealth. And then we think of poor, starving, crippled, tiny Tim and how he's the one that best grasps things. I don't think Jesus is saying here that poor is something you should strive for. Or that we should excuse poverty, that we should look at poverty and say, well, we don't need to do anything about it because look at them, they're just so happy. They're experiencing life at its realest. We should know that. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. There is something to be said for that, though, because you depend on God a lot more. Perhaps you go to bed praying for something to eat tomorrow that Ebenezer Scrooge never would have thought they'd have to even consider there would be something. Maybe you're a little closer to the kingdom because you're a little closer to getting into the kingdom. It could happen tonight or tomorrow. 
Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now. Now, I'm not hunger for righteousness, but your belly is grumbling. Blessed are you who, are hung, who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. It's not denying your weeping. It's not putting it down. It's recognizing that it is right where you are and where you should be. But there's still blessing because you will laugh someday. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. We can't skip that phrase. Jesus looks his disciples in the eye and he says, guess what guys, none of you are getting rich off of this game. You're going to be poor and hungry and you're going to be weeping. You're going to be broken hearted. You're going to be like beggars out in the field gleaning, lead, gleaning grain with unclean hands. That's what you get when you follow me. And people are going to hate you. They're going to exclude you. They're going to insult you. They're going to reject your very name. The very essence of who you are. They're going to reject you because of me. They're going to hate you because of me. They're going to insult you. They're going to exclude you. They're going to cut you out because you're going to be a holy roller. You're going to be a Bible thumper. You're going to be one of them. They're going to hate you because of me. You're still going to be blessed. And you are blessed right now. While you're already, while you're poor, while your stomach's rumbling, you're blessed. Part of the facts of life. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. See, they, they hate you right now, they insult you, but that day is coming. And, and that, that whole biblical, that day, the day of judgment, the day of the Lord, that day, you're going to be rejoicing. It might not seem like it now. It might seem like this is terrible and unbearable and why did you sign up for this? But there's going to be a payoff. And in that day, rejoice and leap for joy. And understand that the prophets of God who were dealing with the things of God were hated and rejected and despised and ridiculed. They were insulted. But they kept on doing it because they knew there was something better coming. And then Jesus gives the mirror of this. Uses the same kind of language, repeats some of the same words, links the th same idea, thought for thought for thought. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Now, Jesus is not saying it's bad to be rich. No more than he's saying you should seek to be poor. But he's saying, if you're rich and you're focused on that wealth, and everybody gives you your status based on the fact that you are rich, if you are self-identifying because of your wealth, then you've gotten everything you should expect to get. And if you're hung up on that, and your whole identity is wrapped up in the fact that you've got more money than anybody else on the block. That's what you're getting. Woe to you, because you're going to find out someday that that really wasn't worth what you thought it was. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Now does that mean that when you go to the party for the big game today, that you should only nibble on the carrot sticks because you don't want to be well fed because you don't, no, that's not what it means. But that if that's all the further you're thinking is your physical comfort, your physical fat and happy, well, you've got 
what you've asked for, but the time's going to come when you're hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you are mourn and weep. Oh man, please don't take Jesus literally. That alas and woe and it's terrible if you laugh. No, Jesus was a funny guy. I think Jesus told a lot of puns. He did a lot of wordplay. I think he's, a lot of things he said, he said with a twinkle in his eye. I think if he was as grouchy as I am half the time, that there's no way that the little children would have wanted to come to him anyway. I think Jesus was a laughing Jesus. Woe to you who laugh now. Isn't criticizing you for being happy. Isn't saying, well, you're supposed to, to go around all serious all the time. Woe to you who laugh now for you, you will mourn and weep. Woe to you if you think that life is all about laugh and joy, and if you don't think there's ever going to be a hard time. Because you can be in for a rude awakening when sometimes it's not all fun and games. You will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. Well, isn't that a terrible thing? Isn't it awful that somebody would say something nice about you? That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, but when all you have here is flattery, when all you hear is, is puffery, woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. See, I told you it was a thought-for-thought thought correlation. Rejoice in that day and leave for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. If nobody has anything that bad to say about you, you probably need to think about what you're doing. If nobody ever criticizes or insults you because of the things of Jesus, maybe you're not doing the things of Jesus right. If nobody's ever put off by your expression of your faith, maybe you're not expressing your faith right. Because everybody likes those who stroke their egos, who make them feel good about themselves, who never challenge them. Everybody feels good about the false prophets that tell you everything's going to work out and you're okay and God loves you anyway. They need to hear the truth. God loves you in spite of your sin. There's a reason Jesus says to the woman, go and sin no more. I love you, but I don't like what you do. And let's face it, that upsets people. God loves you, but he wants you to change that. He wants you to stop doing that. Well, we want God to love us while we do what we want to do. I think Jesus would be perfectly comfortable with the lyrics that Alan Thick and Gloria Lori put together for that show. You take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have the facts of life. I think it kind of fits in here with this sermon on the plane. There's going to be good and there's going to be bad, and if all you ever focus on is the good and all you've ever received is good, maybe, maybe you're not looking to depend on. If all you've ever known is happiness and comfort, if you've never had your heart broken over your sin before God, then why would you accept the gift He's offered? If you can't look at the communion table, if you can't look at the cross and in that see your brokenness, to see your need for a Savior, why would you ever accept a Savior? And so you take the good, you take what Jesus gave, you take the bad, you take the sin that you've lived with. And you reject, you put it together, you reject that sin. I mean, you accept the truth of your, your circumstances, you, you, you accept the reality that sin is there, but now you say, I turn my back on that and I take the life that he offers. 
Well, there you have the facts of life. Disciples, you have the facts of the disciple of life. You might not get rich serving Jesus. And you might go hungry sometimes. And there's going to be plenty of weeping. But there's a payoff at the end. People might hate you and insult you, and put you down, but there will be dancing and rejoicing and great reward. Or to use another biblical word, great recompense. But if all you've ever known is comfort, rich, well-fed, laughing, eat, drink, and be merry, you might have gotten all you could expect because you've never seen the need And everybody's talking about how great you are. If you're that great, you don't need saving. You don't need. If you're Mr. Perfect, well, why would you be worried about sin? If you are the goat, the greatest of all time, what do you have to repent of? So I think. Jesus came down on that level place where everybody was the same. And he took that diverse group and he said, life is true for all of you. And he looked at his disciples each of the time and said, let me tell you about the facts of life. Now you've got to make a decision, and you've got to make a decision, and you've got to make a decision, and you've got to make a decision. What are you going to do now that you've got the facts? Let's pray here. Holy God, thank you. Thank you that you allow us to see in both the good and the bad the opportunity to have more of Jesus. to hunger and thirst, to weep, to cast ourselves on you and feel your comfort, to be sustained, to be lifted up. Thank you. For the opportunity to hear the words of Christ and call into question our preconceived notion about success, about validation, to hear these words and reflect on them. To not let them just bounce off us of one more lecture, but to hear a parent leading us into our next steps. Helping us set priorities and worthy goals. Thank you, Lord, for the facts of life laid out before us. And thank you for that greatest truth that Jesus is a choice between life and death. Help us be bold in making our choices. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus. Amen. This concluding hymn, it's 442 if you're using one of our hymn lessons, it's also in your worship packet. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. When I'm poor and I'm hungry and I'm weeping, when I'm hated and excluded and insulted and rejected, there's a blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And that's just a foretaste, a sample of what's yet to come. Let's sing together, blessed assurance.
Valentine's Day love story. This is my story. Lost in his love. Wow. That's some imagery, isn't it? Lost in his love. Thanks for being here. Thanks for worshiping with us. I'm glad that we could unite together as we worship God, as we can take the good and take the bad, that we can understand these facts of life. We're sinners. God loved us. Jesus died for us. He called us to himself. He called us by name so that we can be lost in that love. Man, if that's not a love story, I don't know what is. Thanks for being here. Go now. Go in the name of Jesus Christ. Go. Share his love. Be a blessing. 